Austin Weston, the Center for Cosmetic Surgery is proud to present the new You Now podcast, today featuring one of the founders, Dr. George Weston. And now, here's your host, Rebecca Bennett and Dr. Weston. We often hear from the people who get plastic surgery, but we don't often hear from the plastic surgeons themselves. Here at Austin Weston, we've launched the new You Now podcast, so our trusted, experienced doctors can answer all the questions that you might have been a little bit too nervous to ask. Today, I'm talking to the man himself, Dr. George Weston, a board-certified plastic surgeon. Well, how are you today? I'm great. How are you? (laughs) Good, thanks. All right, so before we started recording, you said that a lot of people used to think that plastic surgery was for the rich, vain, and foolish, but really yes. it changes people's lives. It what does, have you seen? It does change people's lives. Uh, I can remember when I was training, um, the general surgeons and the heart surgeons thought that going into plastic surgery was trivial. You know? and, and so it, we were not held in high esteem, at least not back then, you know, because it, was, it wasn't felt that we were doing something significant with our lives by focusing on on plastic surgery. And it was felt that it was for the rich, vain, and foolish. Um, But, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years, and and we see people's lives change out of cosmetic surgery. I mean, it's not for the rich, vain, and foolish. Like I said, vain people don't come in. Vain people think, I'm perfect. Why should I have cosmetic surgery? That's what I consider vain. But the idea, I think, for cosmetic surgery is to help people get their attention off of their appearance so that it's not a big issue for them. You know, I mean, focusing too much on your appearance in life is a loser because there's only so far you can take it anyway. And so um, the idea is to help people get their attention off of themselves. Not it, The paradox is that you have to put so much attention on yourself in order to get your attention off of yourself. <laughs> And you founded the practice in 1987. How has the industry changed since then? Oh, well, you know, Dr. Austin started this practice in 1978. I don't think a lot of people were having cosmetic surgery back in 1978. Uh, and, and people thought that, well, you know, you're going to starve. But uh, he was so good at it, and, and it became popular. And, uh, and in five years, he had the biggest plastic surgery practice in, in Washington. And so I joined him in January of 1987, and the practice has just grown tremendously since then. You, you've noticed uh, plastic surgeons come out of the closet, so to speak. You know, it, it used to be hush hush, and now it's no longer that. People don't mind talking about it and uh, and revealing to their friends that they've had cosmetic surgery. And and so you know, you go out there and have dinner, and everybody is talking about cosmetic surgery. It didn't used to be that way. And, of course, Austin Weston is on the on the name, but you have other doctors here. Yes. When you are looking for other doctors to be here, or when Austin Weston is looking for other doctors to be here, what, um, what sort of specialties are important to have here? I know all the doctors I've spoken with have been, all of them, their number one thing is making sure that people feel confident about themselves, that it's an inner thing more than it is an outer thing. Is there something that you're looking forward to in your colleagues? Oh, our practice focuses mostly just on cosmetic surgery, and only about 10% of the board-certified plastic surgeons in this country just do cosmetic surgery. The majority of plastic surgeons do a mixture of both the reconstructive surgery and cosmetic surgery. Uh, we believe that you get really good at what you do every day, and so that's why our focus and our love is just cosmetic surgery, and that's why we get good at it. I don't spend my day doing reconstructive surgery like, you know, reconstructive surgery after mastectomy or cleft lips and palates or burns or accident victims. No, we do just cosmetic surgery, and we do a lot of it, and that's why we get good at it. And as far as looking for other associates and partners, uh I found Dr. Austin, and and he found me, and I wanted to just do cosmetic surgery. And so it was a good fit. There weren't very many people that were wanting to just focus on cosmetic surgery back back then. And then we have added uh, Dr. Siegel and Dr. Poindexter and now Dr. Ajibati to our practice. And so the, the focus has to be someone who loves cosmetic surgery and not reconstructive plastic surgery, right? right? And, and I can remember, 
we graduate in this country somewhere probably nowadays around 200 plastic surgeons a year is all. And I believe there are like 18 to 20,000 medical students that graduate wow. every year. And so there are very few slots for plastic surgeons. We're looking for board certified plastic surgeons or, or, or surgeons that that are on their way to board certification in plastic surgery. Uh, we're not looking for someone who just calls themselves a cosmetic surgeon. Anybody can call themselves a cosmetic surgeon. There is actually not a specialty that is recognized by the American Board of Medical Specialties in just cosmetic surgery. And so you have to be careful out there when someone calls themselves a cosmetic surgeon are they a for real board certified plastic surgeon? They may not be. Mm -hmm. They could be a dermatologist or an OB doctor or a family practitioner that calls themselves a cosmetic surgeon. Mm -hmm. And after doing this for for so long, do you reach a point where you're like, okay, I, I've mastered every kind of surgery, mm -hmm. I got it? Or are you constantly having to sort of pivot to to the industry standard and new new science and those sorts of things? Yeah, I don't think you ever feel like you have mastered cosmetic surgery. I, I've, I've done a bunch of things in my life. I, I, sports, I've, you know, I've, I was a high school quarterback. I played baseball and I played golf. The only thing harder than plastic surgery that I've ever done is golf. A, no one ever <laughs> masters golf, even Tiger Woods, uh, you know, although he was the best in the world, uh, probably never felt like he was a master at it. Um, but uh, we probably are as masterful as anyone in, in cosmetic surgery, even, even though every day I go back there and in the operating room and try to do it the best I've ever done it. And, and so we all never feel like we're good enough, mm -hmm. I don't think. I, I read an interesting article once on, on the transition of uh, how you become a master plastic surgeon uh, like you, you start off in medical school and then as an intern and the the first phase that you go through is you are unconsciously incompetent in other words you, you don't know that you don't know mm. and that's why they don't put scalpels in interns hands <laughs> <Okay>. <clears throat> so the next phase that you go through is that you are consciously incompetent you understand at least that you don't know mm -hmm. and so you're less dangerous at that point right <laughs> and then and then the next phase is uh, you are consciously competent so you you know what you know and you know what you don't know and so you can study up on what you don't know and, and get better at it but the master plastic surgeon is unconsciously competent like at the end of the operation uh, uh, you ask him what he did he probably doesn't even remember you just go in there and your your hands do it and you've done it so many times and and you're focusing on the result and not the technique on how to get there right. it's kind of like you know michael jordan when he was shooting a basketball was not thinking about the technique of shooting a basketball right right he just yes shot. he's unconscious hmm. right i love that and that's the way we are back there in the operating room i think you and and it, you can probably apply that to anything like like your teenager learning to drive mm -hmm. they are unconsciously incompetent <laughs> to start with right <laughs> and they go through all these phases and you and you hope that they become a master one day well we pulled up a before and after picture that certainly makes you look like a master mostly because i feel like this is a crazy combination of different types of of surgeries and i have to say when i first saw this it took my breath away can you kind of quickly summarize what you did here uh, this is an unusually good result i think it probably if you look at our website this is probably one of our best results uh, this is a lady who lost a lot of weight I, I don't know if she had a gastric bypass operation but she lost lots of weight and so when you lose a lot of weight, you, you tend to sag mostly everywhere. Uh, this doesn't show her face, but I suspect if you lose 100 pounds, your face suffers also. 
Uh, and so she came in and, and she had done a good job losing all the weight. And you can see that she has uh, droopy, depleted breasts and her, her tummy has folds of skin. And so um, the late term for this operation, I guess, would be a mommy makeover where you operate on breast and abdomen at the same time. And so what she had was she had an abdominoplasty that included some liposuction, and she had a breast lift uh, with a breast augmentation as well. And you can see that uh, she's not perfectly symmetrical, even her abdomen is not, but you can see the asymmetry in her breasts. And so you have to lift one breast way more than the other. If one breast is, is larger than the other, you either have to have different size implants or you have to reduce one breast to, to try to make it match. Mm -hmm. And so she's got good symmetry and she's tight. And this, you can see, would change your life. Yes. Uh, you know, the, the, the lady on the left probably would not be comfortable having an intimate relationship. And the lady on the right uh, you should call the Playboy Bunny photographer <laughs> and, and have them come out and take the photo. Indeed. She also, what I noticed is she has a very pretty belly button. How do you, do you have to do some kind of reconstruction on the belly button when you're doing surgery on the stomach? You know, the belly button is an interesting piece of anatomy. And uh, I, the first day of life, okay, you're born, you're connected by the cord to the placenta right. that's, that's, uh, that's, stuck on the side inside of the uterus and so you're born connected to the cord and what they do uh, is they clamp it and they cut it and it shrivels to be your first scar of life is your belly button and and so although it was functional uh, as a fetus uh, providing the fetus with blood supply from from uh, the mother uh, it's no longer functional and so it's just a dimple scar um, uh, the most important uh, reason uh, as an adult, I guess, for the belly button is that you can't get into heaven without a belly button. <laughs> you know? and so you get there and St. Peter looks at you and goes, uh, you no belly button, you're not getting in here, right? <laughs> and, and so what we do at, at, uh, at an abdominoplasty is we cut around the belly button and we preserve it. It's, it, it, it's a, on a stalk. Uh, it's a scarred stalk, if you will. And then you just have to make a design so that it doesn't look abnormal. You know, when you look at a body, you, you and nobody focuses too much on, on a belly button, not on the details of it, but if it looks abnormal, uh, and then it, you, it. you just look weird. Right, yeah. And I also noticed um, scars under her arms. Do those fade? I'm assuming those are from the surgery, and do they fade with time? She has uh, scars around her nipples, she is straight down and underneath, kind of like an anchor. Once those scars fade and turn white, they are not very noticeable. If you look on our website, a lot of those scars uh, are noticeable still because it's only been three months since we took the right. photos. Right. And so they haven't yet faded. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing for a tummy tuck scar. The scar generally is pink and noticeable for six months, and then it begins to fade, and it probably can take it six more months before it fades. And speaking of scars, one of the topics we wanted to talk about today was capsular, con capsular contracture. <laughs> Can you give a quick uh, dictionary definition of what that is? And so we're so we're gonna we're gonna go to the car dealer to talk about new cars, and and but you want to talk about automobile accidents when you get there, <laughs> I guess. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can do that, all right, but there's a lot of good stuff about, about uh, breast surgery, and, and then there's the complications of, of any surgery that you can talk about, of course. Um, breast augmentation is, is a great operation. Um, mostly what breast implants give you is a bigger version of what you already have. If you have droopy breasts, uh, that are asymmetrical and unshapely, a breast augmentation is going to give you a bigger version of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when someone comes in and they want breast surgery, let's say they want a breast augmentation, but they have droopy breasts, I, I usually recommend a breast lift and a breast augmentation at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
And as far as you know, things that can go wrong with uh, breast augmentation or breast surgery, uh, it, it's breast implants are a little different from all the other uh, surgeries that we do because we don't do implants generally anywhere else. And so the implants have their own set of possible complications. Uh, uh, when a woman comes in, she wants a breast augmentation. Uh, we talk about uh, how you design it, and also we talk about the good and the, and the bad of it. Uh, when you want a breast augmentation, generally there are three things that, that you want to look at. You, 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 do you want a silicone versus a saline implant? Um, uh, what size implant do you want? How big do you want to be? And where would you like to make the incision? And generally, we either make it at the areola or at the nipple or underneath. And so after you've talked about those things, then you talk about, well, what's the, what's the possible downsides of, of uh, breast implant surgery? Uh, you can make a bad scar on the outside of your skin is a possibility. It's not very common. Um, the most common um, complication, especially the one that would require reoperation of a breast, would be what you just mentioned was a capsular contracture. That's where the body makes scar tissue around the implant and gets tight. Uh, there, there are different um, uh, uh, bad things regarding a capsular contractor, it, it can just be a firm breast. Mm. You know, instead of a nice soft breast, it can feel like a tennis ball, for instance, wow. stiff and firm. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes what happens is it can change the shape of the breast. When it contracts, the, it can squeeze the implant and put it into a different position. And so occasionally you have to reoperate on those breast implants. I read an article from a very respected group of plastic surgeons in, uh, in Atlanta who calculated their percentage of reoperations, and in the first year, they operated on between 10 and 15 percent of their patients for a complication. We don't have that complication rate. Uh, I wouldn't guess that ours is certainly probably less than 5 percent. Wow. Uh, it's not 10 or 15 percent. Uh, as far as what causes capsular contracture, there are a whole lot of things that are associated with, with it, but there's no real known one cause for it. For instance, if you bleed a afterwards and get a hematoma, you're more likely then to have scar tissue form around the implant and it get firm. Or a seroma, um, things like radiation therapy, for instance, uh, after a mastectomy for breast cancer can make an implant get hard. And so you can probably determine while you're speaking to the patient whether they're at a greater risk of having this than others, right? If they have had an implant before and they've had a capsular contracture, certainly they're yes, at a greater risk easy. of yes. doing it <laughs> doing it again. It's right. hard it's hard to predict. There are other things like placing the implant underneath the breast gland rather than underneath the muscle. Right. will increase your risk of getting a capsular contracture. Mm -hmm. Using an implant that's a smooth surface versus a, versus a textured surface will increase your risk of a capsular contracture. But almost all plastic surgeons today are using smooth implants because the textured implants have been associated with this rare uh, large cell lymphoma. And so most people are getting away from, from textured implants for that reason. So it, it's always a trade-off. Would you rather have a higher rate of, uh, of lymphoma or a higher rate of capsular contracture? Well, I'll take the capsular contracture. And that's why everything that we do in, in every one of these operations is calculated to give you the best result with the least complications that we can. But it's always a trade-off. Like, for instance, the armpit incision uh, has more capsular contracture than an underneath incision. And, and a nipple incision has more capsular contracture than an underneath incision. Wow. And so, it, but where would you like the scar? Mm -hmm. and, and so everything we do, and we can talk about all these things with the patients and, and make the choices. You know, how big do you want to be? Where do you want the incision? Do you want a silicone or a saline implant? Silicone implants are, are generally softer and more natural than a saline implant, but a saline implant has a less 
possibility of a capsular contracture. So it's not ever straightforward. Wow. And all the more reason to find a, a good doctor. Yes, you want, a, doctor. you want someone who does this every day. You, you don't want someone who does it occasionally. All right. Well, before I let you off the hot seat, I'm doing this with all the doctors for every episode. I'm going to give you a couple quick rapid fire questions. Uh You got to tell me the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Yikes. All right. (laughs) Number one, what is the most common misconception about your industry? The most common misconception about plastic plastic surgery surgery Mm -hmm. is that it's for the rich, vain, and foolish. I I, (laughs) I guess we're, you know, it's trivial. (laughs) You know, why would anybody subject themselves to an operation for vanity? You know, that's, uh, that's, I think that's still the thinking out there. What is the most common procedure that you're asked to perform? Uh, Probably at this point, a mommy makeover. Wow. What is the easiest procedure to perform? That's not an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's the perception that there might be an easy one. As soon as you think that it's, this is going to be an easy one, you go back to the operating room and, and it bleeds too much and, and, or something. You know, as soon as you think you are really good at it and, and that nothing bad can happen, then God tends to hand you your ass. <laughs> Have you ever had to say no to a patient who asks all the, for something? All the time. I said I said no yesterday to a patient. She looked too good. Have you had plastic surgery before? Yes. Would you mind telling us what? Let's see. Uh, in the it's been thirty something years ago. Doctor Austin did my eyelids, my uppers and lowers, mm-hmm. and I. Uh, I felt that I looked tired, and I would come into the office, and everybody would say, uh, what, were you up all night in the emergency room? No, I had eight hours sleep. And so I, we go through the process just like every patient does, and I sat down with Dr. Austin's practice manager, Carol, and I said, Carol, I'd like Dr. Austin to handle the bags under my eyes. And she took one look at me and said, what about your upper eyelids? Oh. And I go, what about my upper eyelids? <laughs> And she says, well, they're hanging down there on your lashes. And I go, they are? And I looked in the mirror, and damn it, they were. (laughs) And so I ended up having my uppers and lowers done at the same time. And I've had some liposuction uh, of my abdomen and flanks. And uh, I'm due for a facelift. Um, and so, but I'm on blood thinners at the moment for uh, atrial fib, and I don't want to bleed. And so, maybe as soon as I can get off of that, maybe I'll have one of the guys or I'll all of the guys the do my facelift. I was thinking the way we would do this was that we would divide it up and we'd just have a little contest, okay? <laughs> we would have <laughs> one of the guys do one half, and one of the guys do the other half, and, and we'll. You know, video it and have a little contest and Perfect. see who wins. What do you, what do you think? <laughs> I love it. Maybe, this also might determine the answer to the next maybe question. Maybe we should call the Discovery Channel and have, <laughs> yes, them, have them do a piece on that. What do you think? Yes, this, and it might determine the answer to the next question, which okay. is, who is your favorite doctor at Austin Weston? I am. <laughs> <laughs> What? I mean, that's just a stupid question. Uh, I mean, no, they're all better than I am, quite frankly. And and when a patient comes in and they have a have a small problem or something, I go, "Your biggest mistake was you chose me. You, know, <laughs> you should have chose one of the other guys, and you wouldn't have had any problems." No, I wouldn't go anywhere else for plastic surgery, and I, I wouldn't even think of it. You know, um, the other surgeons not only have they operated on me, they've operated on my wife. I would trust them to do anything, and I would never go anywhere else. They're fabulous. When we're looking for another surgeon to join our practice, and and of the 200 uh, uh, residents that that graduate every year, uh, I can remember we had like 70 of them apply for our one position. Wow. And so when you think about that, that, that's like, amazing you know and so all of the surgeons here are superb they're well trained like i said they're better than i am and and so um and they should be better than uh than i am you know i learned so much from dr austin uh but the pupil the pupil should always become better than the teacher 
right? Yes. They learn everything that we know, and then, then they have their own thing, too. Well, thanks for chatting with me. Sure. I, was, <laughs> I feel like I just babbled too much. It, it's, uh, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> it, it, get me started and I won't shut up, right? Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to this episode of Austin Weston's New You Now podcast. If you liked what you saw or heard on today's episode, please like and subscribe to our channel. And if you have any questions about any of the topics we've covered today or in past episodes, send us an email at hello at austin-weston.com or just leave us a comment below. See you next time. For more information, visit austin-weston.com or call our offices for a consultation, 703-893-6168. And make sure to subscribe to our podcast series, Austin Weston, the Center for Cosmetic Surgery.